Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're getting into the next Napoleon's Marshals video. We're getting up to the really, really well-known Great Marshal, so I'm excited for this. Just so everybody knows, I am working on a handful of different things for the YouTube page, um, a couple of different avenues, but one of the things that I've got going first is a Facebook page. I just opened it up this morning, so you can follow me on there, Race of History. I'll be putting some of the videos and stuff stuff over there. Um, also over there, I'll be putting up things like the series I'll be getting into next, all the things like that. I'll take recommendations over there. Just another way to follow me. If you would like to, you can find me at Race of History on Facebook. All right, with all that being said, let's get into it. Six, Marshal Suchet. Yes, yeah, Suchet is the one who who knew the deal with Spain. He was the he was the one that stopped fighting a conventional war in the way that it was being fought everywhere else. He went to the hearts and minds strategy, something that you know is it has relevance all the way up to the modern day. But he was the one that that really saw how the war could be won in Spain when all of the other marshals were really struggling. Louis-Gabriel Suchet was born in Lyon, the son of a prosperous silk merchant. Plans to join the family business were derailed by the French Revolution. Suchet, an ardent Republican, joined the cavalry of the Lyon National Guard. In 1793, he was elected to lead a volunteer battalion and at the Siege of Toulon, distinguished himself by helping to capture the British commander, General O'Hara. He also made friends with a young Major Bonaparte. Suchet went on to serve under Napoleon in his first brilliant campaign in Italy, fighting at Lodi, Castiglione and Bassano. Transferred to Massena's division, he led his battalion with distinction at Arcole and Rivoli, was wounded twice and promoted colonel. It was in Italy that Suchet learned the most valuable lesson of his career. For troops to be effective, they must be properly paid, clothed and fed, something the French Republic consistently failed to achieve. Yeah, and you had marshals who were like looting, taking money, taking everything of value they could find from an area. And they were becoming personally extremely wealthy, but a lot of times the troops were not taken care of at all. Despite proving himself to be an excellent organizer and dependable in battle, Suchet never quite made it into General Bonaparte's inner circle. He went on to serve as a highly effective chief of staff to General Brun, and then to Massena in Switzerland, and was with Joubert in Italy who died in his arms at the Battle of Novi. Suchet was promoted to General of Division, and in 1800 he was given command of the Army of Italy's left wing. With Massena besieged by the Austrians in Genoa, the defence of southern France fell on his shoulders. In a brilliant independent campaign, he held the Austrians near Nice, then chased them back into Italy, taking 15,000 prisoners. Despite this impressive record, Suchet was not on the list of marshals created by Napoleon in 1804. Worse, in 1805, he was effectively demoted, being given command of a division in Marshal Land's Fifth Corps. Nevertheless, it was a role he performed with great skill. His division distinguished itself at Ulm and Austerlitz and the next year led the attack in Napoleon's crushing victory over the Prussians at Jena. The next year in Poland, his division saw hard fighting at Bultusk, but was then held back to defend Warsaw and missed the great battles of Eylau and Friedland. Napoleon heaped rewards on General Suchet, money, titles, but still no Marshal's battle. In 1808, Suchet's division was sent to Spain, where he'd spend the next six years. His first role was to support the Siege of Zaragoza, 
Then, on Marshal Land's recommendation, Napoleon gave him command of Third Corps, and made him Governor of Arahon. Suchet found his troops to be poorly supplied, ill-disciplined and low in morale. Their first battle together against General Blake's Spanish army ended in a humiliating rout at Alcañiz. Suchet found the drummer who'd started the panic, and had him shot in front of the entire corps. Wow. He then reorganised his troops and restored discipline and pride, with two quick victories over the Spanish. He also faced a guerrilla war in Aragon, a popular insurgency driven by hatred of the French invader. This is where this tactic that he's using, this broad tactic, this is where it's really beneficial. Because, obviously, when you have guerrilla forces, the big thing is who's on your side and who isn't, right? Everybody looks exactly the same, so it's hard to tell who is who. Well, when you're extremely harsh on the civilian population, basically everybody's against you. Even the ones that aren't outright fighting you are still giving up supplies and information and all sorts of stuff to the guerrillas. When you start to turn them towards you, you not only get their help in the form of information and stuff like that, but they also stop giving it to the other side. That's why this is such a big deal, because it allows you to stop fighting every civilian everywhere you go. Suchet drew on French experience of fighting counter-revolutionary insurgents in the Vendée, and realised that it was only by winning over the civilian population that he'd be able to make progress. He made it his first priority to ensure his own men were properly paid and fed, something almost unheard of for French troops in Spain. He enforced discipline and made sure requisition supplies were paid for. He told his troops, I will look after your well-being, and you by your discipline will give security to the inhabitants. You will make them, by your conduct, care for the government of King Joseph. He told the Spanish people, My troops will not impede your harvests nor overcrowd your cities. They will live in the countryside, ready to protect you. Religion and clergy will be respected. Crucially, Suchet also promised protection from the many Spanish guerrilla bands, who behaved no better than bandits. Yep. His practical... What was it that gave him this massive broad view of how to do this? Because I, I know that it talked about him being in another situation, I guess, that played out sort of similarly. But he has a massive broad view of this. Not just, we're not going to pick on the local population, but actually, we're going to stay out of the city. We'll, we'll protect them from the banditry of the guerrilla forces in the area. It's, you know, paying the troops. It's just a very, very broad uh, way of implementing the tactic. And I'm curious as to where, how, how he knows all this, especially when seemingly nobody else in France understands it. It's really bizarre. Full and humane approach won respect and brought results. The guerrillas could never be completely defeated, but Suchet made Aragon the safest and best-run region in occupied Spain. He extended French control of eastern Spain with a series of successful sieges at Lérida, Mequinenza and Tortosa. In June 1811, he took Tarahona. For this victory, Napoleon finally awarded him his Marshal's Battle, the only one earned in Spain. Then... Wow. That's... I mean, I feel like I knew that because everybody just sucks in Spain. But man, the only one awarded in Spain, that tells you how drastically different he, his success, and his methods were versus everybody else. And he moved south. He defeated a larger Spanish force at Sacuntum, 
then took the great city of Valencia, along with 18,000 prisoners and nearly 500 guns. Napoleon rewarded Suchet with the title Duke of Albufera. But the overall situation in Spain was deteriorating steadily. The partisans became better organised and supplied. The British Navy was able to land troops on the coast to make diversionary attacks while Napoleon withdrew more and more units for his own campaigns in Russia and Germany. After King Joseph and Jourdan were defeated at Vitoria, Suchet had no option but to pull back towards the French frontier. OK, so my question to you guys is, could this have been successful if Napoleon wasn't constantly pulling troops well, if he wasn't going and getting into other conflicts while this was going on, if he had been solely focused on Spain, could Spain have been pacified to the point of being a legitimate, you know, subject of France? Or was there just too much pushback and there would have been this constant push and pull anytime Napoleon went to do anything? there would be these huge flare-ups. What, what do you guys think? Leaving behind several well-supplied garrisons. On Napoleon's abdication, Suchet remained undefeated, still holding the French frontier. When Napoleon returned from exile, Suchet went to meet him in Paris. It was the first time they'd met in person in eight years. Marshal Suchet, you have grown greatly since we last saw one another, the Emperor told him. He entrusted Suchet with command of French forces in the south, an important independent command for which few men were better suited. Suchet dutifully kept France's enemies at bay, until news arrived of Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo. Following the second Bourbon restoration, Suchet was dismissed and retired to his country estate, where he died in 1826. He was still held in such esteem in Aragon that a mass was held to pray for his soul in the Cathedral of Zaragoza. That is crazy. That is crazy. Think about how much the Spanish hated, hated the French. And yet he was so different that they actually had kind of like a, well, they did. They had a, a remembrance for him. They had a mass for him. That is really crazy. Suchet was a brilliant commander, widely regarded as the best administrator in Napoleon's army. He was also one of the few who thrived with the responsibility of independent command. He never had the opportunity to prove himself on the war's decisive battlegrounds. But when Napoleon, in exile on St. Helena, was asked to name his best general, he replied, That is difficult to say, but it seems to me that it is Suchet. 5. Marshal Ney Do you guys feel like Suchet is overlooked because he was basically in Spain the whole time? Because he didn't he wasn't in command as a marshal, and then when he was, he was basically just in Spain. Do y'all think it's because of that that he kind of gets overlooked in the, the best of the marshals? <laughs> Michel Ney was a Cooper's son from Lorraine, a German-speaking region of France on the eastern frontier. His father wanted him to become a clerk, but the young Ney, impetuous and headstrong, joined a Hussar regiment instead. He soon distinguished himself as a fine horseman and fencer, and was a senior sergeant by the time of the French Revolution. When war broke out, Ney was made an officer, and became aide-de-camp to General La Marche. His reports describe Ney as active, brave, and a skilled tactician. Ney served in the Netherlands and on the Rhine, fighting at Valmy, Jemat, and near Vinden. He was seriously wounded once and captured once. 
Fellow officers nicknamed Ney the indefatigable. His men preferred Le Rougeau, the ruddy or red-faced. The 30-year-old Ney was now a proven brigade commander. Despite refusing promotion more than once, regarding himself as unqualified. In 1799, following glowing reports from General Bernadotte, he finally accepted the rank of General of Division. In 1800, Ney and his division played a major role in General Moreau's great victory over the Austrians at Hohenlinden. This brought him to the attention of France's new First Consul, Napoleon Bonaparte, with whom he'd still never served. When they met in Paris, they warmed to each other. Napoleon entrusted Ney the delicate task of imposing his Act of Mediation on Switzerland, which he carried out with swift efficiency. The same year, Ney married Agli Louise Augier, a friend of Josephine's daughter, Hortense, now Napoleon's stepdaughter, drawing him closer to France's future imperial family. In 1804, Napoleon proclaimed a new empire, and Ney was made a marshal. The next year, he was leading 6th Corps to war against Austria. He was accompanied by Colonel Henri Jomini, a Swiss officer and military theorist. Ney had been quick to recognise his talent, giving him a job as his aide-de-camp and helping to publish his work. Jomini would win fame as one of the 19th century's great military thinkers, and served Ney well as his chief of staff on several campaigns. During the advance against the Austrians, Jomini encouraged Ney to ignore orders from Marshal Murat that would have allowed the enemy to escape. Their decision was vindicated when 6th Corps won a brilliant action at Elchingen that closed the trap on General Mack's forces at Ulm. Ney's corps missed the Battle of Austerlitz, but was in action against the Prussians the following year. There had already been signs that Ney's aggressive instinct, which made him a brilliant tactical leader, could also get him into trouble. At the Battle of Jena, Ney ignored his orders and charged straight at the Prussian lines, becoming cut off. His troops had to be rescued by Marshal Land's corps. A furious Napoleon remarked, Ney knows less about soldiering than the last joined drummer boy. Ney was criticised again by Napoleon three months later, when his foraging raids into East Prussia appeared to provoke a Russian offensive. The winter manoeuvring culminated in the horrific Battle of Eylau, which Ney's corps reached only as darkness fell. That summer, Bennigsen's Russian army launched a surprise attack, hoping to encircle and destroy Ney's 6th Corps near Gutstadt. Ney, outnumbered four to one, conducted a brilliant fighting withdrawal and escaped the trap. A week later, Napoleon caught Bennigsen's army at Friedland. Ney led a crucial attack on the enemy. That man is a lion, said Napoleon watching his advance. Sixth Corps on... He went from a drummer boy to a lion real quick there. Slot shattered the Russian left, leading to one of Napoleon's most decisive victories. For all his flaws, Ney had proved himself one of Napoleon's best tactical commanders, and was rewarded with the title Duke of Alchingen. In 1808, Ney commanded a corps during the invasion of Spain. Great. He spent more than two years in the Iberian Peninsula, and like most of Napoleon's marshals, found it a bitter and frustrating experience. In 1810, he joined Marshal Massena for the invasion of Portugal, but deeply resented being placed under his command. He criticised every decision, helping to create a poisonous atmosphere at French headquarters. The French advance... What was the reason for that? Why did they... Why did he so, so bitterly hate him? I mean, I know a lot of them didn't get along with each other, but why specifically did, did he hate him so much? And did, did, did it really make a difference? Like, 
were they going to get their teeth kicked in here at Lisbon anyway? Because I feel like they were not in a great spot. Once on Lisbon came to a halt at the lines of Torres Vedras. During the subsequent retreat, Ney again demonstrated his brilliant tactical skills, fighting a series of rearguard actions that kept Wellington's troops at bay. But Ney's fury at what he considered Massena's disastrous leadership boiled over into open insubordination. He was relieved of command and returned to France. But he did not remain in disgrace for long. Napoleon knew Ney's worth in battle and that the army adored him. He'd be needed in Russia, and was recalled in 1812 with command of Third Corps. Here we go again. You go to Spain, you get your teeth kicked in, you leave in disgrace, and you're like, all right, back on the move. Where are we going? We're going to Russia. As the Grand d'Armée advanced deeper into Russia, Ney was always near the action leading attacks at Krasny and at Smolensk, where he was wounded in the neck. Amid the slaughter of Borodino, Ney led his corps in attack after attack on the Russian earthworks. When they were finally taken, and he was told that Napoleon would not send in his reserves to follow up their hard-won gains, he exploded with anger. What business has the Emperor in the rear of the army? Since he will no longer make war himself, let him return to the Tuileries and leave us to be generals for him. Ooh. It was typical of Ney's lack of restraint. But his blind faith in the Emperor did not survive Russia. Henceforth, he'd fight only for France. It was during the retreat from Moscow that Ney ensured his place among the legends of military history. Just two weeks into the retreat, the Russians routed Davout's rear guard at Vyazma, and Ney and Third Corps took over. Ney was not only an instinctive tactician and apparently immune to fear or fatigue, he could inspire or bully other men into superhuman feats of bravery and endurance. A French officer later recalled, I can see him still at the spot where the fighting was hottest, speaking to the men, indicating to the generals what positions they should take up, animating all hearts with the confidence that flashed from his glances. He made an effect on me I don't know how to describe. Yeah, I talked about this in the comments of another video, but it is almost indescribable what a front leading general or commanding officer does for the morale of an army. Like it, it really is because it's not measurable. It really becomes hard to explain how big of an impact they can make, but you can see it in battles. Historically having one of these guys that is so, um, I, I, don't, I don't really know how to explain it. He's so um, willing to put himself in the line of fire. He doesn't ask his troops to do things that they know he wouldn't himself do. And that makes a huge difference. If you're being asked to go into an extremely dangerous situation, it's very easy to think, well, he's just sending us to die. Whenever you have a commanding officer who you know would be willing to be right there next to you going right into it. The morale of the army is just totally, totally different. At Krasny, when the rear guard got cut off from the rest of the army, Ney angrily rejected calls to surrender and led his men in an astonishing forced march across enemy territory, crossing the frozen Dnieper River at night personally pulling men from the river when they fell through the ice. I think you guys convinced me that I was being too harsh on him in the initial video, and that it's probably a situation where they are going to die regardless. And so getting them out, getting as many as he could back to the main army was the best move. And the way he did it was crazy, really. Surrounded by Cossacks and down to 800 fighting men, 
they formed square and kept moving. Ney was more than a hero to the army. He was its talisman. News of his escape caused rejoicing throughout the army. Napoleon himself remarked, what a soldier. The army is full of brave men, but Michel Ney is truly the bravest of the brave. Ney led the rearguard for the rest of the retreat, and according to legend, was the last man to cross the Nyman River into Poland. His leadership helped many thousands of soldiers to make it back alive. Ney was rewarded with the title Prince of the Moskva, and continued to serve throughout 1813, though his relations with the Emperor, and Marshal Berthier in particular, were increasingly strained. At Lützen, Ney was moved by the conduct of his young conscripts, who bore the brunt of Blücher's surprise attack, but fought back bravely, helping to win victory. Napoleon then entrusted Ney with command of three army corps, 84,000 men. But the plan for him to fall on the enemy's flank at Bautzen went awry. Badly drafted orders led to delay, and the coalition army was able to escape. Ney fought in the Emperor's great victory at Dresden, but ten days later, at Denevitz, his limitations as an army commander were horribly exposed. Throwing himself into an attack, he lost control of the battle, and was badly beaten by Bernadotte's Army of the North. Ney was devastated by his defeat, but Napoleon kept him in command of his northern wing. At the gigantic four-day Battle of Leipzig, he commanded the northern sector, holding the line until a shoulder wound on the last day forced his return to France. He rejoined the army in 1814, and fought in the defence of France, commanding the Young Guard, and personally leading a bayonet charge at the Battle of Montmirail. In April, Ney, outspoken as ever, was among the first to confront Napoleon with the reality of his position, and force his abdication. Ney was fated by the restored Bourbon monarchy as France's greatest soldier, but he could not hide his contempt for the returning aristocrats who treated his family with disdain. When the king's niece reduced his wife to tears, Ney confronted her, shouting, I and others were fighting for France, while you sat sipping tea in English gardens. In February 1815, Napoleon escaped from exile on Elba and landed in France. Ney was horrified by the prospect of civil war, and promised the king that he'd bring Napoleon back to Paris in an iron cage. But he soon saw that the army was flocking to Napoleon's banner. When Napoleon appealed to him directly as the hero of Borodino, Ney made the fateful decision to cast in his lot with the Emperor once more. Yeah. When Napoleon advanced into the Netherlands in June to take on Wellington and Blücher's armies, Ney commanded his left wing. But he made a string of blunders. Against Wellington's troops at Quatre Bras, he was too cautious when he held the advantage. Two days later at Waterloo, Napoleon left much of the tactical handling of the battle to Marshal Ney. It was a mistake. Yeah. On his own initiative, Ney launched a series of mass cavalry attacks too early, and failed to launch any coordinated attacks on Wellington's position until late in the day. He had four horses killed under him, and personally led the last doomed attack by the Imperial Guard. Ney's courage that day was awe-inspiring, but his decisions helped to cause the French defeat. In the aftermath, Ney spurned several chances to flee France, and was arrested for treason by the restored monarchy. A military court refused to pass sentence, so his case went to the Chamber of Peers. With the King's allies demanding that an example be made of Ney, the outcome of his trial was never in doubt. Five of Ney's fellow marshals were among a large majority who voted for the death penalty. 
on the 7th of December, 1815. He That's the crazy part to me, is the marshals who, who voted, who voted yes. That's... That's crazy. What's, what's the reasoning? And I know that's probably different for every marshal. But is it, is it spite overall? Or do they really have this belief that they're doing what's right for France? Like what's, why, why is that the decision? That seems really brutal. That you would sentence somebody to death who essentially is of the same position you are. That seems rough. He was marched into the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris. Soldiers, when I give the order to fire, fire at the heart, he told the firing squad. Wait for the order, it will be my last to you. I protest against my condemnation. I have fought a hundred battles for France, and not one against her. Marshal Ney was among the most inspirational battlefield commanders in history. A born soldier and brilliant tactician, unless his fiery temperament got the better of him. He lacked the confidence for high command, but under the Emperor's supervision, he proved one of the Grand d'Armée's greatest combat leaders. 4. Marshal Soult Jean de Dieu Soult was from a small town in southern France and enlisted in the Régiment Royal, aged 16. He became a tough, capable sergeant and in the build-up to the Revolutionary Wars joined a new battalion of volunteers as their drill instructor. Soult's self-confidence and bearing meant he was soon made an officer. The unit went into action against the Prussians in 1793. In a brutal baptism of fire, half the battalion became casualties, though Soult's own conduct was praised. After a spell on the staff of General Osh, he joined General Lefebvre's crack vanguard division. Soult learned much from Lefebvre, a future fellow marshal, serving first as his chief of staff and later as his best brigade commander. Soult's rise from sergeant to brigadier general took less than three years. In the process, he won a reputation as an organized and decisive commander and brilliant tactician. Who, who was the marshal that rose quickest? I'm, I'm curious about this because we've gone through the last handful, of, I feel like the last lot of them, had, had all had very quick rises in, in military rank who got got up there fastest? He also began a bitter, long-lasting feud with another rising star, General Michel Ney. In 1799, Soult established himself as one of France's best divisional commanders, fighting under Massena's command at the Battle of Zurich. He was then put in charge of three divisions to pursue General Suvorov through the Alps, proving his ability for high command. In his report to France's new first consul, Napoleon Bonaparte, Massena wrote, For judgment and courage, Soult has scarcely a superior. The next year, Soult and Massena were besieged in Genoa. Soult led a series of daring raids on the Austrian lines. Until he was shot in the knee and captured, he was robbed and spent days in agony in a filthy hospital an episode that may explain Soult's later reluctance to lead from the front. On his return to Paris, Soult received a hero's welcome from Napoleon. His rewards included an honorary rank as Colonel General in the Consular Guard, plus command of troops assembled at Saint-Omer for Napoleon's planned invasion of England. Soult, the old drill instructor, imposed strict discipline and trained his men hard earning the nickname Bras de Fer, Iron Arm. Even Napoleon wondered if he was being too severe, to which Soult replied, 
those that can't handle what I myself endure will be left behind in the depots. Those that can will be fit to conquer the world. In 1804, Napoleon proclaimed his new empire, and Soult received his Marshal's Battle. The next year, his impeccably drilled troops became 4th Corps, the largest corps of the Grande Armée, and marched east to take on the Third Coalition. That December, at Austerlitz, Napoleon entrusted Soult's corps with the main attack on the enemy centre. As he issued his final orders to his marshals, the Emperor turned to Soult last, and said, As for you, Soult, I say only, act as you always do. Fourth Corps' attack was the decisive blow of the battle, though its success owed much to Soult's exceptional divisional commanders, Saint-Hilaire and Van Damme. With victory won, Napoleon acclaimed Soult the foremost manoeuvrer in Europe. However, it was observed that Soult was now less inclined to expose himself to enemy fire, taking a more managerial approach to command, though his planning, organisation and tactical instinct remained superb. I feel like they need more of those though. Like they have the guys that are willing to throw themselves into enemy lines and lead from the front, and guys that in the heat of the moment can be kind of quick thinkers, but struggle being kind of more reserved because they're in the heat of it all the time. I feel like having a, a marshal, they, I feel like they really need more of these. More guys who are in the back, they are staying kind of out of the fray and handling things as they come without getting too caught up in the actual fighting. Like, I feel like this is what they need more of. The next year, Soult's corps played an important role at the Battle of Jena, and in the pursuit of the defeated Prussian army that followed. In the brutal winter battle at Eylau, his troops held the centre of the line. Soult's relationship with Napoleon was excellent, and the Emperor frequently turned to him for advice, much to Marshal Berthier's annoyance. In 1808, Soult was ennobled as the Duke of Dalmatia, and later that year led a corps in Napoleon's invasion of Spain. When the Emperor returned to France, he entrusted the pursuit of the British army to Marshal Soult. The British nicknamed Soult the Duke of Damnation, and he harried them through the mountains of Galicia to La Coruña. But in battle, he could not break their lines nor prevent their escape by sea. Soult then marched south and occupied Porto, where rumours began that he was considering crowning himself King of Portugal. Whether the rumours were serious or not, in May the British and Portuguese took Soult by surprise, and drove him out of Portugal with heavy loss in men and supplies. This was the most ignominious chapter of Soult's mixed record in the peninsula. Five years that saw sparks of brilliance, but also missed chances, shocking avarice, and a reluctance to cooperate with other commanders. Later in 1809, Soult replaced Marshal Jourdan as King Joseph's chief military advisor, and led French forces to a crushing victory over the Spanish at Ocaña. He then oversaw the French occupation of southern Spain. Appointed Governor of Andalusia, Soult administered the region with cold efficiency from his headquarters at Seville, though avoiding harsh measures where possible. He lived in royal style, and notoriously looted Spanish churches on such a scale that he soon amassed one of the great art collections in Europe, worth an estimated 1.5 million francs. Wow. He was increasingly aloof and even his aides found him difficult to like. Soult's character is hard, and above all egotistical, one wrote. He takes no more than a passing interest in those around him. In 1811, with Marshal Massena's army stalled outside Lisbon, Napoleon ordered Soult to give support. Like many of Napoleon's long-range interventions in Spain, the objectives were unrealistic. 
Yet Soult marched north with 20,000 men, capturing Badajoz, but withdrew on receiving news of an enemy landing near Barossa. Two months later, he marched north again to relieve Badajoz, now besieged by the enemy, and met Beresford's larger army en route at Albuera. Soult launched a flanking attack that threw the enemy into confusion, but he failed to follow up his advantage, and left the tactical handling of the battle to others. Nor was he on the spot to inspire his troops, and his army suffered a bloody defeat. Where was he? Like, what was he doing? The next year, Wellington's victory at Salamanca forced Soult to abandon his palace in Seville and retreat to Valencia. Though that autumn, he had the satisfaction of reoccupying Madrid and pursuing Wellington's army back to the Portuguese frontier. In 1813, Napoleon summoned Soult to Germany, where he fought at Lützen, and supervised the main attack at Bautzen. But when news arrived of the calamitous French defeat at Vitoria, Napoleon sent Soult back to Spain to take charge. Soult inherited a demoralised, disorganised army. He quickly imposed order, turned it around, and attacked. It was an impressive feat, but his mostly young conscripts were up against experienced, well-led troops. Two attempts to relieve the besieged garrison of San Sebastian failed. Soult began a fighting retreat through the Pyrenees mountains back to France. Despite the limitations of his demoralised conscripts, he ensured Wellington's army had to fight every step of the way, counter-attacking whenever possible, and offering resistance till the end, even as Napoleon's empire began to collapse. The last battle of the campaign was fought at Toulouse, a bloody and unnecessary one, as Napoleon had abdicated four days earlier. Under the Bourbon Restoration, Soult became an unpopular Minister of War. Like Marshal Ney, he initially opposed Napoleon's return from exile, but saw which way the wind was blowing, and rallied to the Emperor. Napoleon made several dubious appointments in 1815. One was to pick Soult as his new Chief of Staff, replacing Marshal Berthier. Not only did this waste Soult's command abilities, since his new role was merely to implement Napoleon's orders, Soult also inherited a complex staff system of Berthier's own devising. Yeah, Berthier was somebody that I greatly underestimated the importance of until this point, until I saw the video of the build-up to Waterloo and going into Waterloo itself, that was when I really started to understand how important Berthier was, what he was doing, how um, flippant Napoleon could be with his orders, and how it was really Berthier who was kind of holding everything together and disseminating everything in a way that could get everybody to where they needed to go. Crucial errors resulted during the Waterloo campaign, with orders going astray and commanders unsure of their role. Soult's warning not to underestimate Wellington's army was dismissed by Napoleon. You think that because Wellington defeated you, he must be a great general. I tell you that he is a bad general, that the English are bad troops, and this will be over by lunchtime. All right, man, you do you. Following Napoleon's defeat, Soult lived in exile until 1819, then returned to France under a political amnesty. After the July Revolution, he served as a reforming Minister of War, and three times as President of the Council of Ministers, effectively France's Prime Minister. He also became the Grand Old Man of the French Army, elevated to Commander-in-Chief with the exalted rank of Marshal General of France. Wow. Soult died aged 82 in the same town where he was born, known today as saint amand soult Soult's record as a marshal was mixed. A brilliant and intelligent organiser, 
whose ability to deliver a master stroke or inspire his troops to victory waned with time. Yet he was one of the few marshals that Napoleon could trust with a large independent command, a quality he needed desperately, but found in short supply. Yeah. Suchet, Ney, Soult. Join us for the final part of Napoleon's Marshals as we reveal our top three coming soon. All right, well, I'll be back tomorrow with the next Napoleon's Marshals video. I'll also be releasing part three of the Winter War series, either later today or tomorrow, just depending on when I can get it out. It's already recorded. So um, I will see you guys then.